Now, today we've got our very, very, very favorite um, uh, specialist and scientist, Dr. Nathan Finkelstein, uh, affectionately known as Netty. Uh, we absolutely adore him and we love him. And you will see by, by, by the way in which he presents uh, that he's coming from a, from a loving home, you know, Kirsten Bosch Nation Botanical Garden. Now, Dr. Finkelstein um, is a retired pharmacist and um, photochemist. His research involved chemical studies on plant, uh, in the plant family, um, erectai, 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 uh, with a special interest in alkalides and uh, uh, camerons. Um, Doc, you'll help me with those uh, scientific names. <laughs> Neti is a member of the South African Association of Botanists uh, since 1973 and was a convener of the last plant sale of the Kistenbosch branch of the Botanical Society of South Africa. Now, Dr. Finkelstein was awarded a certificate of merit uh, by the Botanical Society of South Africa in 2020. Um, and in his twilight years, he now gets his botanical kick by being an active volunteer garden guide at Kistenbosch National Botanical Garden. I, I can't stress uh, how amazing an individual uh, Nettie is. Um, we absolutely love you and thank you for making time to be with us this morning. I don't wanna take too much time. So Nettie, over to you. But before I hand over to you, to everybody else, if you've got any questions that may come up, please remember our Q&A section at the bottom. Just list any question that you might have for, uh, for Dr. Nettie uh, with us on the line. And um, we will sure get to get him to mention or give us some of those answers at the end of the call. From my side, I will see everybody else on the other side of the call. Doc, over to you. Thank you very much, John, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, why are my slides not advancing? Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. One is always very pleased when they ask a pensioner to uh, address an august audience like this. So thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, you'll notice today that it is the 6th of April. And that is quite a significant day historically because 370 years ago, Jan van Riebeck landed at the Cape with uh, his three little ships and he was instructed by the Dutch East India Company to create a victualling station uh, for the passing ships at the Cape. For me personally, it's also a rather significant day because 43 years ago, I graduated on the 6th of April at Rose University with a PhD. So uh, that is historically what's interesting, but maybe some of you might think that this is a blotch on the picture. And if you follow my arrow, you will see that that happens to be Comet McNaught taken in 2007. And you can see Lion's Head there and also a bit of Table Mountain on the left-hand side. So I bring you greetings and salutations from the fairest Cape in all the world. And uh, I think, uh, and I still regard myself as very privileged living in a beautiful city like Cape Town. Um, I must make a confession at the outset that I'm not a botanist, I am not a physician, and I'm not an historian either. So with those rather shaky credentials, I hope that my presentation will be acceptable uh, to my audience. So let's start off that I was always interested in names of things and the origin of names. And uh, more particularly, when you see these long botanical names, one often wonders where those names come from. And I suppose one can go back to Shakespeare and uh, he expressed it so well, what's in a name? That which we call a rose, and a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And that was in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Now, during my lifetime, uh, I was very privileged and in fact blessed 
to walk with two physicians who I've always regarded as absolutely wonderful uh, uh, teachers. Uh, the one is Professor Jackson, and I'll say more about him in my talk. And the other one is Dr. Jim McGregor, who was a, uh, um, uh, also a uh, very prominent physician and neurologist in Cape Town. And I walked with them and tramped the mountains with them for many years. And I learned a lot from them, particularly from Professor Jackson, who eventually wrote a little book on the origin of names, and also from, Professor, from Dr. McGregor. McGregor was uh, a, a Greek scholar, and I think he used to read Homer for bedtime stories, but uh, his knowledge of Greek was unbelievable. And uh, many of the plant names that have Greek origins, I still remember when he told me what they actually meant. So the first publication that we saw on the meaning of plant names in, uh, in South Africa was in fact done by Professor Jackson. And you will see, I put on the screen, the book that he published. It was a very simple publication in 1987, uh, where he discussed the origins and meanings of names of South African plant uh, genera. And uh, that you can see it was done with the assistance from Dr. McGregor and also in collaboration with Professor Eugene Moll. Later on, we got a very beautiful publication, which was uh, done by uh, 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 Michael Charters and uh, Hugh Clark, and also edited by uh, Eugene Moll. And that was a dictionary of South African plant names. Uh, it's an almost a must on every botanical bookshelf because that is really a wonderful publication to have. But my own interest really was stimulated on a visit to the Royal College of Physicians in London. And uh, when I visited the college, they have a beautiful uh, medicinal garden, which was in fact sponsored by the Wolfson Foundation. And I walked around that garden and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, all the plants there. And uh, uh, for those of you who uh, might have a pharmaceutical bent, uh, this is a wonderful piece of rhubarb. Uh, that is rheum palmatum that is native to China. But look at the size of those leaves. It's just a magnificent specimen and I couldn't help myself but photograph that. The uh, first president of the Royal uh, uh, College of Medicine was Thomas Linacre. And he, uh, just to give you an idea of, of how old the college is, uh, he was the first president in 1519, and he remained the president until his death in 1524. And what is very impressive, and once again, those of you who are pharmaceutical will realize that these little green uh, twisted bits in the front is actually Ephedra sinica uh, growing there in the garden. Now, the sinica does give you an impression that it comes from China, and it is the source of many alkaloids, ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, and in fact, then uh, you can chemically change ephedrine into amphetamines and to methamphetamine or ecstasy. And uh, this is there growing in the garden. But what I was also impressed with was the sort of lovely labeling that they had to, to assist people to understand what the plant actually contains in, uh, in chemicals. And some of these are still seriously used in medicine today. Uh, for example, we have Papava somniferum, and uh, those of you who are classical scholars will see somnus is sleep and ferro is to carry. So that is the poppy that carries the sleep. And from that poppy, we get alkaloids like morphine, codeine, and so on. And you can just uh, methylate uh, the morphine to form a uh, very uh, uh, habit-forming drug like heroin, and so on. So once again, the labeling was just amazing. But when I got to this particular label and I looked at it and I saw 
Olaf Rudbeck, the elder and son now, Olaf Rudbeck came from the medical school of Uppsala. And you'll hear in the next few slides how I extol the virtues of Uppsala when it comes to botanical uh, effort. Um, in fact, uh, Rudbeck the Elder discovered the lymphatic system and uh, the plant that was there was Rudbeckia triloba and uh, it is native to Central and Eastern uh, America. And when I looked at that, I thought, isn't that amazing that you've got the name Rudbeckia, which represents the old doctor's surname in the plant genus name. And then I suddenly stumbled on the idea, wouldn't it be a bad, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually talk about plants that are named after physicians or doctors in South Africa? And uh, that's what got me thinking on it. Uh, while I was at the college, I also purchased a little book that was uh, written by Dr. Henry Oakley. And Henry is actually the honorary uh, curator of the Botanical Garden at the uh, College of Medicine. And that's what really got me going on to the topic, which I've just given a rather catchy title called Blooming Physicians. And the whole focus on what is going to follow now will be plants that are indigenous to our country and that have been named after physicians or doctors. And I suppose it's only natural that we start with the Swedish school because that's where a lot of the early explorers came from. And that was probably, they were all uh, motivated by Carl Linnaeus. Now, Carl Linnaeus was really the father of taxonomy, and he was the man that created the binomial nomenclature that we use in, in most of the biological sciences today, and certainly in botany. Uh, Linnaeus, I think, probably got the equivalent of uh, a knighthood in Sweden because he became afterwards von Linne. Um, and uh, I think that when you get the von that you are sort of elevated to a sort of baronship uh, in uh, some of the European countries. Um, he died at the age of about 71, and uh, he received most of his education at Uppsala. As I said, Uppsala seemed to be the center of excellence when it came to botanical work, because he started giving lectures there in botany in 1730, and 11 years later, he was appointed the professor of medicine at Uppsala University. And as a result of Linnaeus, we had a whole series of uh, wonderful explorers that came from uh, the uh, Swedish school. And the one that is uh, very strongly associated with our particular country is Carl Peter Thunberg. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure whether the uh, uh, Swedish pronunciation is right, but as I remember uh, Dot Malan telling me that it should be pronounced Tunbera, so uh, I'm not quite sure, but anyhow, you'll know who I'm referring to. He took his uh, medical degrees and uh, natural philosophy qualification at Uppsala, and uh, then he won a, a scholarship um, to uh, and a stipend to Paris where he continued his study, but en route to Paris, he stopped over at Amsterdam and he was working with Professor Burman, who was uh, really also a very prominent botanist. But um, he actually joined the Dust India Company in 1771, and he sailed as a ship surgeon to Cape Town. Um, he actually got to Cape Town in 1772, and uh, he then spent several years learning Dutch. And you might ask, why did he want to learn Dutch? Uh, it seemed that he was interested in going to Japan to collect plants there. And because uh, the only way to get into Japan was via the Dutch East India Company. And that's why he learned Dutch in order to do that. And eventually uh, he afterwards was, uh, known as the father of Japanese botany, because he, after he left the Cape, 
he went on to uh, Japan and studied there. Now, um, I'm not going to talk about his Japanese excursion. I'll only talk about what happened here. Poor old uh, Thunberg was rather cash strapped because uh, he had lots of letters of introduction and whatnot. But when he got here, the person who really was a very supportive of the early explorers was Reich Tolbach, who was the governor. But by the time he got here, Tolbach had died and von Plettenberg was not terribly sympathetic to him. And uh, it was only by getting some funding from uh, what was uh, then known as the uh, commissioner um, uh, by the name of Ulof Berg that he actually got a little bit of funding to fund his trips. And he made three expeditions to the interior where he collected over 3,000 plants, a thousand of which were almost new to science. But how did he feature in our plants? The lovely gardenia thunbergii, which I, I hope you can follow my pointer, has got that beautiful white petaled flower. And when that petal, uh, when the flower is fertilized, it has an inferior ovary which expands. And if you look very carefully at the tip of that fruit, you will see the remnants of the flower. That fruit is very, very hard, and the seeds will only be liberated if it passes through the gut of a large mammal like an elephant or a, uh, or a uh, uh, kudu. And uh, this uh, grows very well. In fact, in, at Kirstenbosch, we have uh, probably the oldest specimen, which is marked a centenarian because it's more than 100 years old. When our garden uh, became 100 years old in 2013. Then uh, the plants, which were 100 years or more, were labeled centenarians. So if you go onto the big lawn, you will see that gardenia growing there. And that was named, uh, got the species name of Thunbergia. But he also had one that was, the genus was named after him. And this is a climber. Uh, known as the black-eyed Susan, uh, Thunbergia elata. And uh, that particular plant uh, is a climber, and it is very beautiful. It sort of varies in a yellow to an orange color, and it's got that big black uh, blob in the center, um, which is where you get that black-eyed Susan. Funnily enough, some of the Rudbeckias are also referred to as black-eyed Susan, um, and uh, I'm not going to say much about the expeditions because uh, a colleague of mine has just published a book on those expeditions, and it is Travels with Thunberg. Uh, Alwyn Gibson has uh, just published this book, and she describes in great detail where Thunberg actually went on his three expeditions through South Africa when he collected all these plants. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a nice hook to hang on to because Alwyn will be giving a talk on the same uh, series, uh, I think on the 4th of May. So uh, look out for that particular one and then you'll learn more about uh, Thunberg and his expeditions. The next very uh, important person from Uppsala, also a Swede, was Anders Sparman. And he was a couple of years after uh, Thunberg, and he accompanied Captain Ekberg as a ship surgeon uh, on a voyage to Canton, but he didn't stop at the Cape at that particular time. And uh, he took up a post as a tutor to the children of J.F. Kirsten. Now, Kirsten was... Uh, uh, often erroneously associated with Kirsten Bosch, but he actually farmed much higher up in the Elfin area. But he was also the postmaster at, uh, at uh, Simonstown. Uh, and uh, Sparman actually botanized with Carl Thunberg around uh, uh, Cape Town, and he also took part in some of his uh, uh, travels. In fact, three of the probably the most uh, uh, efficient and uh, uh, wonderful uh, explorers in, in the South Africa in the early 1700s uh, was Sparman, Thunberg, 
and then uh, George III's gardener too uh, was also involved, and that was uh, Francis Masson. But unlike uh, Masson, who was very well equipped, uh, poor old Thunberg uh, really uh, was uh, running on scraps, uh, relatively speaking. He didn't have that fancy ox wagon that uh, Masson had and so on. Anyhow, uh, Sparman actually then joined uh, Cook's expedition as an assistant to two German naturalists, and he was back in the Cape in 1775 and then sailed back from there in 1776 to become the president of the Academy of Science in uh, Stockholm. Now, the plant that was named after him was Sparmania africana, and you'll see the picture of this uh, there. What is rather interesting is besides the lovely white petals, this has a bicolored stamen, which is sort of yellow and, uh, and red. And those stamens are quite sensitive that when they are stimulated, they actually almost open up into a sort of lotus position. And I'm going to share a little video link with you to show you how that actually happens. If you look very carefully, when I start the video, you'll see that when you stimulate those stamens, they start flattening out. And it would be similar to what would happen if the pollinator would get onto those stamens. And obviously, the bigger the spread, the more pollen will be distributed. So let me put start that if it works. Just go back again. Okay, um, I then uh, move on to the last of the Swedish school, and that is George Wallenberg. And he was also demonstrating botany and professor of medicine at Uppsala. And he actually succeeded Thunberg as the professor. Um, he uh, published the Flora Laponica, and he was a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, associated with Wallenberg is the plant Wallenbergia capensis, or the African bluebell. And there you can see the plant is a lovely blue color. And uh, I even managed to get one with a pollinator on it, that bee going for it. Now, when Wallenberg died, that chair, which was previously known as the professor of botany, chemistry, and medicine, was then divided into more the limited professorships. So then that uh, was no longer a, a mixed sort of professor. He was professor of medicine thereafter. Now, I think that it's only right for us to talk about our own people, and that is the South African school. Now, I'm going to start off with Frederick Zeevogel van der Merwe, who was who had a BA and then went to Trinity College, Dublin, where he got his MBCHB, and then he got a diploma in tropical medicine from Liverpool and a DPH from the University of the Bratis Rond. And uh, he was dabbling around in some plants, uh, as particularly on the aloe and on Scylla. Now, Scylla is a really squill, and in fact, the plant that was renamed was he was given the honor. If you look at the plant, you will see the plant has got a very big, thick, uh, and large bulb, some of which actually protrudes above the ground. And then on that bulb, you will see a, like a rosette of leaves. And then attached to that is a long stalk with some beautiful flowers on the end. That's a close up of the flowers. And you can see that they are a sort of grayish blue color. And that may be what we see in the specific name of plumbia. Now, plumbum is lead in Latin. So the sort of gray 
blue color got it, but you'll see the genus name is now called Merwilla uh, and no longer Scylla. And uh, the Merwilla obviously comes from the from the Merva or the Merva part of it. So that is the first of our South African school. And then we come to Carl August Lukoff, and he did his uh, MBCHB at, at Cape Town and then MD was followed uh, uh, in 44, where he worked on vitamin deficiencies. And his father, James, uh, and himself, they were friends of Dr. Rudolf Marlos and Mrs. Bolas, who were avid plant collectors in the Cape. And uh, in fact, uh, because of his photographic prowess, he actually published a book of photographs on the stapelias of Southern Africa, as well as Table Mountain uh, after 300 years, uh, which he published in 1950. I think that his tombstone says it all uh, in that he was, uh, I must just get that, I must just get this, this thing out of the way. And it says that he was a bewaarder van ons berge and a beskermer van ons erfenis. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Afrikaans, uh, it could perhaps be translated as the protector of our mountains and the custodian of our heritage. And uh, I think that says it all for uh, Lukov. Um, in the Cape Medical Museum, we have a lot of his father's books which were inscribed uh, by, that is James Lukoff. And uh, in fact, uh, many of the uh, plants and you would have expected him because they were avid plant collectors, uh, particularly of the, uh, of the succulents that we have a Conophyton Lukoffii, we've got an Alienopsis Lukoffii and we also have other plants named after him as well. There's the Diplosoma Lukoffii, and as you can see, uh, if I just put the pointer on it, it grows in the uh, sort of Namakuland area where there is a lot of quartzite. And you can see these quartzite crystals uh, where the plant is growing. Uh, lately, we've had a lot of uh, theft of uh, these small little uh, succulents, uh, and it's become quite a problem. Uh, uh, at the moment, we are losing succulents on the West Coast side uh, very, very fast. These lovely pictures, I must acknowledge, uh, were given to me by uh, Adam uh, uh, Harrower, uh, who's at Kirstenbosch. Uh, really wonderful pictures. Then I did mention that, uh, Professor Jackson. Uh, Professor Jackson came to South Africa in 1949 after he served with the Royal Air Force uh, Voluntary Reserve and he joined the Department of Medicine at UCT, he became the professor there and his great interest was in diabetes, uh, becoming the president of the Diabetic Society and uh, so on. He uh, was a fellow of the University of Cape Town and he retired from the Department of Medicine in 1982. And believe it or not, he went back to university at that stage to go and do a BSc in botany. And uh, he never had any formal bot botanical uh, qualifications, but he felt that he wanted to do that. And he, I think, passed it with first class honors too. Um, I walked with him as part of his A team, which he started. And uh, he was the author of two lovely table uh, uh, books, uh, Wildflowers of the Fair Escape and uh, the uh, um, Wildflowers of Table Mountain. And he had an Erica named after him. I think uh, Baker uh, decided to name that uh, Erica, Erica Jacksoniana, because uh, he was doing that in honor of he, uh, being the president of the Botanical Society of South Africa. Now, a lot of people don't know that Peter Jackson was also quite a, a botanical artist. And these are three of his original art pictures, which I inherited. After his death, uh, the, uh, the uh, art pictures were divided amongst some of his 18 members. And unfortunately, I didn't go when those were handed out, but uh, one of my colleagues in 1993 wrote me a letter to say 
that they picked out some pictures for me and they knew that I was working in the plant family Rutaceae. So they obviously picked this Acmedinia out for me and a few of the others. And you would see that uh, botanically, these were really beautifully drawn and uh, very, very accurately drawn as well. The next uh, South African that really made a mark in botanical circles was Louis Vogelpool. Louis Vogelpool was born in Mozambique, believe it or not, in the old Lorenzo Marx, now known as Maputo. And he obtained his uh, MBCHB at UCT. Uh, he was awarded a Nuffields uh, and Adams scholarship, which took him to the National Art Hospital in London. And that's where he developed that lifelong uh, passion for cardiology and expertise. He, lectured part-time uh, at the university in cardiology, and he was awarded an MD with first-class honors in 1959. But Louis Vogelpool was really the expert on ericas and also on South African orchids. And uh, this is one of the or orchids. They did name it uh, uh, Dyser Vogelpooliae, but it, it is uh, just a color variant of the uh, Dyser uniflora, which is found in the Cape Peninsula. This is Erica Fuchelpullii, which is named after uh, Louis. And uh, I must say that he was uh, uh, wrote many, many books on the orchid. He was the founder of the Orchid Society. He was also gold medal recipient. And uh, I have one of his books in my library, which was on the Dyser uniflora. Uh, and uh, there he went into great detail on how to propagate that uh, very, very difficult to grow orchid and how to do it. Uh, it's really a wonderful publication if you can ever lay your hands on that because it's uh, probably out of print uh, from many, many years ago. Then more recently, uh, we have uh, William Ivor Jardine. Now, Ivor was schooled at uh, Bishops and he got his MBCHB at UCT and he was a medical missionary for many years when where after he returned to uh, Grootskir Hospital in 1997 to specialize in ophthalmology. So he became a fellow of the College of Sur uh, Surgeons of, in ophthalmology of South Africa and he was involved in the Proteatlas project and in point of fact he actually succeeded Professor Jackson after his death as the Botch Sox A team member uh, leader for uh, several years. He collected many species uh, of plants uh, all over the show and he was granted the Botch Sox gold medal in 2013. Here's a picture of Ivor in the Cedarburg and he discovered a plant which interested me in particular because I worked on the Agathosmas as a, and many of you may not recognize the genus, but it is the buchus. Uh, any South African will know what a buchu is. And these buchus have a very lovely uh, 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 smell. It's very odiferous uh, because of the volatile oils in the leaf. And uh, this particular agathosma then got his name. It was called Agathosma jardinii. And there you can see uh, Ivor relaxing in the lovely cedar, Cedarburg. And then last but not least, we have Christian Frederick Louis Leipold. Uh, Leipold had a, an absolute, I think right from the word go, he was uh, a man who could write. He grew up in the rural Clan William area and any of you go to Clan William uh, uh, Museum, you will see that two of the sons that were honored was Leipold and the other one was the comedian Tola van der Merwe. Um, and he went on to Cape Town to train as a journalist and he was the editor of the Daily News until that publication closed down. Then he decided to go to uh, uh, London to study medicine and he graduated from Guy's Hospital at the age of 27. He was the first medical inspector of schools and he was the editor-in-chief of the SA Medical Journal until 1944. He wrote many uh, books uh, and eventually received, uh, and uh, those books varied from novels to cookbooks and, of course, uh, poetry. And uh, 
the, he was an avid plant collector and particularly also amongst the aloes and the succulents. And in fact, the one particular plant that has the genus has his name called Lipoltia frutescens is one of these uh, West Coast succulents. When Leipold died, he was actually buried in the Pakais Pass. And there, if you look at this, you will see the stone of the uh, where he was buried in the Pakais Pass, which is just uh, other side of uh, Clan William. And the reason why I kept Leipold for last was that he wrote a lovely little poem in Afrikaans. And uh, I remember that I was taught in Standard 2 we extolled the virtues of the month of October. And those of you who don't understand Afrikaans, I'll try and give you the gist of it afterwards. It went something like this. That is the month of October, the moiste, moiste month. For yulkies in the forest, for yulkies blow and roy, for yulkies urals in the felt, and I so moi. What he was saying is that in uh, the month of October, these uh, uh, plants, uh, the lacanalias, actually come up and uh, they are known in Afrikaans as fiulkis and they come in all sorts of various colors. And funnily enough, the lacanalias were also named after a doctor. And that is why I've kept this one to tag on to the first of the Swiss school of doctors. And that was Werner de Lachenal. So now you can see where the lacanalia comes from. And this little blue lacanalia is lacanalia unicolor. And this one is bulbifera or the red one. And you get yellow ones, alloides, and so on. Uh, so in fact, the, the, the poem that uh, Leipold wrote was uh, in the, uh, about the lacanalias. And of course, the man who actually uh, uh, coined the name Lacanalia uh, was the Swiss professor of botany at the University of Basel. And uh, he was a pupil of Haller, and you'll hear more about Haller when I discuss the German school. And uh, he also uh, improved the university garden, which is the oldest in Switzerland. Then we have two other Swiss brothers, uh, Johann and Kasper or Gaspard. Uh, they were both physicians, and uh, in fact, they were professors at the University of Basel, and uh, uh, they were very prominent doctors. And uh, the plant Bohemia galpani was named after the Bohin brothers. And that uh, particular plant is in flower now. I saw it at Kirstenbosch the other day. It has a beautiful brick red petals and it's got leaves that tend to fold and like that one over there where my pointy is and they look almost like a butterfly uh, and uh, when this plant is finished flowering it has a pot and that gives you an, immediately uh, the indication that it belongs to the pea and bean family or the fabaceae family one thing that's rather strange is that this thing is a common name of pride of the cup. And funnily enough, this plant does not grow in the Cape. It actually grows in Mapumalanga. And there is an area there that is known as the cup. And that's where it got the name. So erroneously, a lot of people think that this plant actually comes from the Cape. It does not. And we then go on to the Dutch school. And we have there Evert Jakob van Wagendorf. Van Wagendorf was a uh, physician. He studied medicine at Leiden and Utrecht, and he became a doctor of medicine. In fact, he then lectured in chemistry at Utrecht and became the professor of, and notice again, of medicine, chemistry, and botany, all the pure sciences plus medicine. And he eventually became the director of the botanical garden. Now, if you walked around the pond area of Kirstenbosch, around about December, January, you will see these Wachendorfias uh, in profusion there. And they're beautiful yellow flowers, and uh, they really come up and they make quite a show. And when you actually dig up the root and you cut that root, there is a, a red dye that exudes from that root 
And that is also gives you an indication that this plant is classified under the plant family Hemodoraceae. And immediately you see him, you think of blood. So that's where it probably got the name blood root because of the red dye that oozes from the root when that root is cut. Now let us go on to the German school of botanists and doctors. And the first of this is of this group is Johannes Hieronymus Knipoff. Now Knipoff was a lecturer and physician and became professor of medicine at the University of Erfurt. And he uh, did many, many things on plant illustrations, but he left the heritage that the so-called red art poker, which they are still a few flowering at Kirstenbosch at the moment, are actually associated with them. I suppose if you were German speaking, you would pronounce it Kniphofia, but uh, it's uh, Kniphofia or the red art poker. And we have this beautiful one on the left there, Coalescence, which has got lovely gray green foliage. And then the ordinary precox, which is sort of yellowish at the bottom and red on the top. So it does resemble a poker that is uh, been poked into the fire uh, recently. Then I did mention Haller uh, when we spoke about uh, one of the Swedish botanists who studied under Haller. And Albrecht von Haller was uh, a Swiss uh, botanist actually, but he eventually became the professor of anatomy, surgery and botany at the University of Göttingen in Germany. where And he studied under Burav, who was also a very well-known botanist at uh, Leiden in, and he gained his MD there. The plant that we have in Kirstenbosch is a tree by the name of Aleria lucida, known as the tree fuchsia. And it's got long uh, crawlers like that, beautiful reddish orange color. And it's usually visited by the uh, sunbirds. And uh, when they eventually form fruits, they are like berries that hang from the tree. Uh, it's uh, a really a lovely tree and you should look out for it when it is in flower because these flowers come from the little stalks uh, on the tree itself. It's really very beautiful. And then we come to uh, Martin Heinrich Karl Lichtenstein. Now Lichtenstein was uh, really one of these unsung heroes of public health in South Africa. Um, I heard a very interesting lecture by uh, 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 one of the uh, historians, uh, Dr. Roger Stewart, on uh, Liechtenstein recently. And if any of you are interested, I think there is a recording of that uh, available. But Liechtenstein actually came out to South Africa at the time uh, of the Batavian Republic uh, between 1802 and 1806. He actually came out as a tutor to the son of the governor of the Cape, uh, uh, General Janssens, and uh, he eventually became his personal physician. Um, Janssens, of course, uh, uh, also was assisted by de Mist, uh, uh, who also brought a physician out, uh, by the, um, and this physician was really a, a very, very uh, great guy who, uh, in fact, uh, uh, was a, a person by the name of Renia Dibbets. Uh, Renia Dibbets uh, was the first to actually inoculate people against smallpox in the Cape. And funnily enough, it was really uh, 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 Liechtenstein, although he came out to be a tutor, he was suddenly dumped into becoming a uh, public health doctor. And he, in fact, uh, managed to control a, uh, uh, a plague of uh, dysentery. And it was worse than dysentery. It was actually an amoebic dysentery that occurred on the Rondebosch Common. Um, and uh, uh, he was also responsible at the time when there was a smallpox uh, epidemic uh, near Klawater, which is now the old Griekwastad. Uh, that he prevented that uh, smallpox epidemic from actually uh, coming into the Cape. 
and he actually trained the missionaries, Costa and Janssen, to uh, immunize the people there. Although, uh, sadly, uh, Liechtenstein also contracted uh, the uh, dysentery, he did not die uh, from it as many did. And in fact, the mortality rate was something like 25% uh, who died from amoebic dysentery. Eventually, they moved the camp from Rondemarsh Common because uh, there was uh, such a mess there. But uh, he was a great man and probably an unsung hero in terms of public health uh, in South Africa at the time. And uh, he left when Janssens was uh, recalled back to, uh, to, uh, uh, the, uh, back to the Netherlands. He went with him. And from there, he went back to Germany, where he became the professor of zoology at the University of Berlin. And if you go to the Berlin Zoo, you will see a bust of Liechtenstein there. And uh, in fact, uh, Liechtenstein had a couple of plants named after him. One is not too pretty, is the Liechtensteinia, uh, Liechtensteinia lacera. And you can see where they got the name lacera from if you look at the lacerations on the leaf of this particular plant. And then there was the Rolfarki or the Barleria Liechtensteiniana, which was also attributed to Liechtenstein. When Liechtenstein went uh, with General Janssens, uh, they, uh, they left the Cape in 1806. They touched on at St. Helena. And at St. Helena, that is where Liechtenstein actually met Birchall. And he encouraged Birchall to come to the Cape. And of course, Birchall was also one of those wonderful botanists and early explorers at the Cape uh, and uh, so on. When uh, I was rather interested when they treated uh, the amoebic dysentery in those days, they used a mercury compound called calomel. And uh, I don't think that it did much to the amoebic dysentery, but uh, probably if anybody was going to die, they would have died of mercury poisoning rather than anything else. But that was another story. Uh, so that was Liechtenstein. Then we go to the Italian school, and there we have Giovanni Zantedeschi. He was an Italian physician, and he was an Italian botanist. He was born in Molino, he died in Bovegno, and he studied in Italy and graduated with honors in medicine and surgery practice in Tremessine and then in Bovegno. And he published a lot of works on the flora of, uh, in the Brescia uh, province, and uh, one plant that was named in South Africa after him was Antideschia ethiopica, which most of us know as the Arum lily. And you get the lovely white variety and the yellow one, the Jacunda, uh, uh, in our country. Um, and uh, it was quite a popular flower. And uh, I show you a picture of a bride in 1934, and you would see a bouquet consisted largely of the, uh, the arum lilies. Uh, these arum lilies uh, has a lovely white uh, sort of uh, uh, covering around the spadix, the uh, yellow part in the center, uh, the spathe, I think they call that. And uh, that, of course, I suppose indicated purity or uh, uh, whatever, and so it was quite a thing. I suppose today the brides might carry a blushing bride or Ceruria Florida in the uh, bouquet or something like that. Uh, I know my late grandmother hated these uh, Erem lilies with a passion because she said it reminded her of death, and I somehow think these white lilies somehow uh, seem to be uh, more associated with death. Um, in Afrikaans, they call this plant the fark lily. And uh, erroneously, the word Af fark in Afrikaans means a pig. And it has nothing to do with pigs whatsoever. But what they confused it with is that sometimes the Easter fark, and that is the Afrikaans word for a porcupine, they dig for the rhizomes of this plant. And they love those rhizomes and eat them. And that is why many times in Kirstenbosch, you'll see big holes dug around them. And that means that the porcupines were visiting the rhizome. So that's where the fark lily comes from. It is not to do with pigs, but to do with the Easter fark. 
or literally translated the Iron Pig. Now we come to the British School of Doctors, and that first one is Nehemiah Gru. And he was a uh, British botanist, physician, microscopist. He did a lot of work with Malpighi uh, in micro microscopy, and he became a fellow of the Royal Society and its secretary at one stage. We have a lovely tree called Gruvia occidentalis, or the so-called crossberry. And you will see the petals are sort of mauvey color with yellow anthers. It's really very pretty. And when those fruit has been fertilized, you get a berry formed. And if you look carefully at the berry, uh, berry and follow my arrow there, you can see the cross in, those, in that tetrad of berries. And that is how it got the name crossberry. And in fact, it is the genus name is named after Gru, namely Gruia. Uh, Occidentalis. And then we have Sir William Watson. Now, Sir William Watson was a, a doc qualified as a doctor from the University of Oxford. He was also a little bit of an amateur inventor. He, uh, together with his friend Benjamin uh, Franklin, invented the Leiden jar. And that Leiden jar is to demonstrate electrostatic uh, electricity. And uh, he was the first to introduce Carl Linnaeus' work into England uh, in the nomenclature. He was a very prominent man. He was got a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and that is, you're in the uh, sort of uh, big league if you become a fellow of the Royal Society. He, it, he was also the vice president of the Royal Society. And he was awarded the Copley Medal and knighted in 1786. And uh, he was responsible, uh, or his name was responsible, for the Watsonias that occur. Uh, this is uh, yours truly on Table Mountain, admiring some of those Watsonias there. And we have many different varieties. I'm not even going to mention the species. They could be Bipyramidalis, they could be Tabularis, Bobonica. There are plenty of them available. But we have to thank Sir William Watson for the genus name Watsonia. And uh, then we come to, and I suppose we can call them British, but uh, they would be fiercely uh, independent uh, in Scotland and not enjoy to be called British, but uh, Scottish. So let's talk about Peter uh, Cormac Sutherland. Uh, he uh, qualified as a doctor from Aberdeen as medical school, and he obtained his MD in 1847. And he set up practice in Fraserburgh, which is on the Scottish North Coast. Uh, he then joined an expedition in 1850 to the Canadian Arctic, and their ship got stranded in Baffin Bay. In fact, it, uh, uh, it was wrecked there. Uh, how he ever got back, I don't know, and I haven't been able to sort of uh, piece that together. But then he sailed for Natal in 1853. And believe it or not, he didn't really shine as a doctor there, but he became a government geologist for Natal in 1854. And uh, then uh, he became a surveyor general, exploring the Drakensberg and collecting botanical specimens. And many of the plants were named after him. And we have this one, so the Landia frutescens, um, which they even put into pill form because it has been averred that it does improve your, your uh, immune system. At one stage, they, they were punting this particular thing for uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, then there was Venonia Sutherlandii, and then of course, Grey uh, Sutherlandii, or the Natal bottle brush. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Suther Sutherlandia as a genus did not persist, and it was renamed uh, the Lysertia frutescens. It's also, you can see, a pod type uh, plant. So it belongs to the Fabaceae family. It has beautiful red flowers with a typical keel like you would expect in the pea or the bean. Lovely gray green foliage. And then these lovely expanded fruits. And uh, these uh, um, are now known as Lysertia frutescens. It's no longer Sutherlandia. Then we come to Lobelius, which is the first of our Belgian uh, doctors. Uh, he was a personal physician to two monarchs, both 
William, Prince of Orange, and James I of England. And uh, these lovely little blue lobelias are named after Matthias de la Obel. Um, and uh, he uh, was a Flemish physician and he studied at Leuven uh, in Belgium and also in France at Montpellier. Of all the lobelias, this is my personal favorite, Lobelia valida. And in Afrikaans, they refer to this as the Chalyun blom or the Chalyun flower. And the reason for that is that the moment that that plant starts flowering, then the Chalyun fish seem to be present. And the fishermen used to be excited to catch a Chalyun because it's a very lovely tasting fish. But they've overfished these now and they are on the sort of threatened list and uh, we can't remove them from the sea anymore. And then uh, the other one of the Flemish uh, uh, doctors was uh, Dudens. And funnily enough, every one of these botanists seemed to like the Latinification of their names. He was Rembertus de Danianus. Even uh, uh, you'll see that uh, Linnaeus liked that too. He was known as Carl Linnaeus. Uh, and uh, that seemed to be quite fashionable then. While he was working in Basel, he uh, published his herbal, the Crater book, or the uh, book on, uh, on spices or herbs. And uh, he became the physician to the Austrian Empire, Rudolf II. And he became professor of medicine at Leiden until his death. The plant that we have in this country is a little tree called the sand olive. And uh, it is Dodonia uh, viscosa var angustifolia. The Latin word angustifolia is narrow. So you can see the narrow leaf there of this particular plant. And then most of you will be, re be relieved to know that I'm on my last slide now. And that is not really South African, but one could probably claim that it was South African when Southwest Africa still was a mandated territory of South Africa. Um, and this is the Austrian by the name of Frederick Martin Josef Welwich. Welwich was born actually in Slovenia and he studied medicine and botany in Vienna. And he worked as a physician uh, in, the, uh, in the Austrian provinces, but he lost interest in, in medicine, and he then decided to go and live in Portugal. And uh, he, when he was in Portugal, the king of Portugal gave him a task to go to the Portuguese territories of Angola and uh, to, to map the flora there, which he duly did. And you can see in the lower part of the slide, he did a catalog of the uh, plants there. And in point of fact, uh, he, uh, he had sort of uh, published uh, a, a long uh, list of those plants, something like 8,000 specimens that he collected, uh, which represented something like 5,000 species, of which almost 1,000 were new uh, to science. After he uh, 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 finished his work there, he uh, went to work in London in 1863, uh, where he uh, eventually landed up at Kew Gardens. And this is quite unlike all the other plants you've seen to date, because this belongs to the plant which do not produce flowers, but reproduce by means of cones. So they belong to the germaniosperms. And in fact, the word Wellwitchia mirabilis uh, is named after Wellwitch and the mirabilis would indicate that it is a miracle plant, that in that dry desert area, it's amazing that anything survives. But that plant has adapted itself so well to those uh, xerophytic conditions, it's just quite un unbelievable. Now, he was quite a modest guy, uh, Wellwich, and in fact, he was quite anti the idea of the plant being called Wilwitchia mirabilis because he wanted it to retain the name Tamboya strabiliflora uh, uh, because uh, strabilifera, I mean, um, because Tamboya was the area more or less where in Angola where this plant, uh, he first came across it. And then the uh, strabilifera, if you break down the Latin word, 
Strobile means uh, the cone and ferro is to carry. So it's the thing that carries the cones. And if you look at the next slide, you will see this lovely leaf, uh, which is in fact a two leaf kind of plant. And this on the right hand side is your male cones. And on the left hand side are the female cones, which are slightly fatter and more oval than the male cones. The male cones have the pollen. And in point of fact, uh, that is how the, the pollination takes place. The Afrikaans word for this plant is actually the Tweblar Kanidut, which translated into English means it has two leaves and it doesn't die because there are specimens in those areas. They're 1500 years old and they're still around. And uh, the fact that it only has two leaves is quite amazing because when you look at the plant in nature, it looks like it has many leaves, but it's the wind that has torn those big two leaves uh, into shreds so that it looks like it has many, many leaves. And uh, perhaps while I'm about it, I must thank uh, uh, Professor uh, Eugene Moll for these two beautiful pictures showing the cones of Wellwitchia mirabilis. And that then takes me to the end of my presentation. And I would like to dedicate this presentation to the late Philip Harry Leroux, uh, who was the curator of Kirstenbosch and who sadly died as a result of a cycle accident uh, in 2018. Uh, now, Philip was also a very modest man, but uh, he never was a physician. So uh, I'm not uh, really putting him into that category, but I always said that Philip had an MBA and that wasn't a university MBA. It was the abbreviation for management by walking around. And he was always around the garden uh, making copious notes for his horticulturists. And at least they did name aloe arborescence, that beautiful white one, uh, was named Aloe Arborescens Philip Leroux. And there you can see it growing naturally, and you can see Castle Rock, part of the eastern slopes of Table Mountain in the background. Now, I hope I haven't put a lot of you to sleep, so it is time for you to wake up now. And I hope that at the end of all this that I've told you, that you may see light at the end of the tunnel as far as nomenclature is concerned in botany. Thank you very much for your kind attention and I will take any questions if there are any. will be joining us shortly. Yes, 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 colleagues. Um, oops. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry for that. Um, I think I was talking and um, I'm a little bit muted at the same time. Doc, oh, what an amazing, I have to start off by this um, short input. I think what um, COVID has done for all of us, I think it stretched us to the limits of having to do this event um, on, a, on a virtual platform. And the beauty with uh, doing this uh, on a virtual platform is that it's recorded. And because of it's recorded, uh, this amazing presentation that you've given us is gonna stay and stand the test of time because of you've just taken us on a beautiful history of just Kistenbos, of plants, of, of individuals. And I love the, the, the beginning part of it when you, <laughs> when, you gave us a, when you gave us a disclaimer that I'm not a historian, <laughs> but many on this platform, on this call today, uh, will beg to differ with you because of you've just, um, you've just <clears throat> been so amazing. So, I just want to start with a simple basic question and uh, we don't have many questions, but just uh, a lot of appreciation from everybody saying, you know, what a marvelous journey, history and flora. Absolutely love this talk, you know, and, and I think everybody's just um, um, just blown away by, by the level of knowledge that you have. So let me start with a simple basic question. 
where does this passion come from? <laughs> that, that is probably a very difficult question. There were many people who played a, a sort of role in my life. Uh, you must remember that I'm, I'm basically a phytochemist by training. So we worked with plants and we were interested in the chemical constituents within plants. Um, it started off that I was interested and we were looking for new medicinal agents from plants. And uh, if we don't know what the plant contains, it's very difficult to in fact decide whether there's anything seriously uh, medicinal in it or not. So you had to do all the chemical work and that's how I started off. Uh, so it was an indirect relationship to botany. But we, uh, when we studied, we did a full course of botany in our first year. And that was then followed by a funny subject called pharmacognosy. Pharmacognosy was the study of plants which had medicinal uh, importance in pharmacy. And you must remember that in the early days, a lot of these plants uh, were used in the form of extracts or tinctures or uh, whatever and made into mixtures and what have you, long before the actual active substances were used. And uh, that is what got me going in botany. Uh, but uh, um, also when I was doing my PhD, uh, we had to lodge a voucher specimen of the plant that you were working on with the herbarium. And I remember uh, that uh, the, uh, the botanist at the Albany Museum uh, was Estelle Brink. Estelle would not do it for us. She said, come on, I'm going to teach you how to press plants and to mount them and do the rest. So you eventually become a, a bit of a botanist. And uh, probably that uh, is how I got involved. And I was very lucky while I was at Rhodes University, walking with uh, people like Dr. Jacko Gillamo. Uh, Amy was a wonderful botanist. And I learned so much about the Eastern Cape flora from her on these walks. And then as I did explain to you, I walked with Peter Jackson when I came back to Cape Town in 1981. And uh, that was also uh, uh, really wonderful. So uh, as I told you right at the outset, I'm not a botanist by training, and uh, therefore I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, 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 perhaps a little bit of, a, uh, of a, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, what, uh, maybe, maybe I, I, I am what I'm not. But uh, what was very interesting, that I am probably one of the few uh, bot non-botanists that was admitted to the South African Association of Botanists, uh, and that happened in 1973. So I've I'm now retired. In fact, they uh, call me a retired uh, member of the SAB or the South African Association of Botanists. But uh, I still uh, attend uh, some of the talks that they have and so on. So. My, I'm, I'm still uh, a botanist at heart, but not a botanist by training. <laughs> wow, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, just looking at your face and the, and the passion that you have in your voice and how you speak about botany, plants and, and the history. One would swear that you just got retired recently and, and you, you actually, you, you don't look like you're aging at all. <laughs> I think it has to do with the, with the wonderful nature that you are surrounded by in your daily life. <laughs> well, I, I think it's probably walking at Kirsten Bosch that keeps me young, John. So I'm 83 now. And I noticed in, uh, in the chat column that one of my ex-students uh, actually uh, enjoyed the talk and he said it reminded me and he says you lectured me in pharmacy 40 years ago and uh, uh, it's it's <laughs> it does make me feel a little bit older than <laughs> 40 years ago uh, so it was a lovely remark to get thank you Linda for that and I also see there was another remark from uh, another student of mine uh, way back uh, yes. I did pass it. Oh, yeah, there's Selwyn Kahanovitz. He yes. said, uh, 
favorite lecturer from my pharmacy days. So I thought they hated me with a passion because I was an ogre and I used to drive them hard. So maybe uh, uh, now in the uh, sort of twilight years that they think of me more, more favorably than they did when I was young and full of uh, beans then. <laughs> Thank you for those kind remarks anyhow. <laughs> I love that you, you are keeping tap tap of those wonderful remarks that are coming in. In fact, while we edit, let me just take a couple of questions quickly. And, and this is a very interesting one. And it's coming from Henley. Henley says, um, what is the Botswalk A team? <laughs> I would love to know that. <laughs> okay. uh, it, was, it was a term that was coined by Professor Jackson. Uh, the Botanical Society uh, local branch, Kim, uh, Kirstenbosch branch, asked Professor Jackson to train uh, people who could lead walks uh, for the Botanical Society. And uh, it was sort of at that time when they had uh, a serial on, uh, which was uh, Hannibal uh, and his uh, cohorts. It was like... Uh, 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 a group of three guys who used to sort of uh, go and do good and so on. And uh, it was called the A-Team. So uh, Professor Jackson decided to call the guys that he was training for that particular purpose, the A-Team. And that's how it got uh, to be. I was uh, joined his group sh uh, shortly after I came back to Cape Town in 81. And uh, I was with him virtually until the day that he died. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, as I say, uh, it, it, he and, and Jim McGregor were regulars. And uh, they, were, they were two real characters. Uh, I uh, enjoyed walking with them. And as I said, I, by osmosis or infusion or diffusion, I absorbed what they told me at the time. And it has always stood me in good stead ever since. And just continued stimulating my knowledge of botany and also the uh, various plants that you could identify on these walks. And boy, did we cover areas of the Cape Peninsula and beyond uh, at that particular time. So I'm very grateful to those two. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I was blessed to be able to learn from two giants like that. So I stand on their shoulders. Ah, yeah, I know from one giant to the other. Um, Doc, let me just take two questions. And um, just to remind everybody that this talk um, has been recorded and it's currently being shared on our Facebook pages. So please go on ahead and like our Facebook page, both the Strict Nature Club uh, Facebook page, as well as the Kistenbosch National Botanical Facebook page. This talk is going to stay there for as long as we can possibly think. And I think um, that is one of the, great, uh, the greatest things about social media and uh, being able to do these things on a virtual platform like this, because it gives us an opportunity to actually record and, and keep this um, for our own records. And we will continue to share this presentation for days and years to come. Let me just take two questions quickly uh, from Roy and Tesmin. Um, and Roy is asking, um, are all the plants mentioned um, on this presentation indigenous to South Africa? And uh, Tesmin is asking a particularly interesting one, um, asking, um, it, would be, it would be lovely, it would be lovely, um, lovely to know if there's any information about connections uh, the doctors mentioned on this presentation um, would have had with uh, some of the indigenous people uh, and knowledge um, systems, I suppose. So, so basically asking whether there was a connection between the doctors uh, that were mentioned on the presentation and the indigenous people and knowledge and what was the knowledge transfer between the two. I think that's particularly interesting one. So let's take those two quickly, Doc. Um, as we just about to wrap up uh, the yeah. presentation and the show today. Thank you for that uh, question. Uh, first of all, all the plants that I mentioned today are indigenous, uh, South African plants, and many of them are growing in Kirstenbosch. And so that's why I stuck to those that if you uh, time it well and you come at the right time of the year, you can actually see them in flower. 
the only one that is possibly outside of South Africa would be the Welwitcher, which I mentioned earlier on. But I thought that it was such a wonderful plant. And, and I must say that uh, the first director of Kirstenbosch must have been inspired by Welwitch because when Professor Pearson came out to South Africa, he immediately wanted to get to Namibia. And he went there in 1904 or thereabouts, and he couldn't get to where he wanted to be because there was a fight between the Germans and the Herreros at the time. And he only got to, Namib uh, to Namibia in, I think, 1908. Uh, but when he got there, he actually was the first person to say that that plant was pollinated by insects because everybody thought the germaniosperms, like the pine, is wind pollinated. And in point of fact, that was a hundred years before the scientists actually demonstrated the fact. A hundred years before the scientists demonstrated, he was actually right that it was pollinated by insects. And that was uh, the only plant that was outside of the scope of South Africa, if you want to call it that. When you talk about the indigenous people, that is where we normally as scientists based a lot of our knowledge and uh, from the indigenous people. But because what was used, and we call that ethnobotany, what was used by the ethnic people of South Africa was in point of fact uh, investigated by people. And in fact, some of the medicines that we are still using to this day can be attributed to that. But that's a talk of another kind. But uh, let's just take the simple one like Buhu. Buhu was well known to the Khoisan and they used it for many, many things. And today people still drink Buhu tea and they still make uh, drink Buhu brandy and they still actually put Buhu leaves in vinegar and apply it to uh, a sprain or something like that. So many of these things uh, in folk medicine are still used today, but uh, there's always a, a danger with uh, using natural products uh, and that people think that because it comes from nature, it's safe, but uh, there are also many toxic uh, plants and uh, that is also a talk of another kind. But uh, uh, suffice it to say, a lot of our knowledge was based on the ethnobotanical uses of these uh, plants by the early peoples of South Africa uh, in order to uh, uh, do further work on it or to see whether uh, uh, the, the claims that were made were valid or not. I hope that answers the question. That absolutely answers the question. And, um, and, and, and I love how you answer the question and say, and, and making us a promise at the same time that you're gonna come back and uh, share with us more, more of the expertise that you have because of, um, I can't think of a better way of, of being able to document the wealth of knowledge um, that um, you know, scientists like yourself have. Um, you know, there's no better way of, of capturing that evidence and being able to keep it together and contain it in a manner in which we can share it publicly on, on social media platforms and be able to share it with some of our loved ones and, and some of the enthusiasts out there. So um, most certainly we want to hold you up to, to, to that last part, how you answered the question saying, it's a talk of another time. <laughs> <laughs> that we're gonna hold you to it and we're gonna make sure that we're gonna have you back here uh, sharing with us amazing, amazing um, uh, knowledge that you've got. Um, Sherry was just asking, um, you know, have, the, uh, have we resumed our, um, our talks, uh, our walks, uh, volunteer walks. Yes, Sherry, we have resumed the walks. Uh, the walks are happening pretty much every weekday and um, yes, Nettie will we, be able to explain. Um, we we, we walk. have walks now uh, still at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock every day, except weekends. Um, uh, but I think it will probably also uh, become more frequent once the visitors to uh, South Africa start making a bit of a comeback. We've already noticed that we are seeing a lot more overseas folk at uh, Kirstenbosch than what we did, uh, uh, say, a couple of weeks ago. 
So I'm I'm optimistic that we will uh, get there. No, most certainly. And um, Belinda, you just had a, a slide up. Uh, just to also remind everybody that's on this particular talk, uh, we still quite have a few on. Um, we've got a wide range of, um, of books uh, that are available, um, all about flora. Um, you know, they are all available at the Strake Nature uh, website, as well as the Kistenbosch um, Botanical Society bookshop. Uh, so please come on over, get yourself one of these beautiful books. Uh, this wealth of knowledge and information uh, that you can get. So if you're looking to stock up some of your library, so please come on over. Uh, what you need to do is for the next, uh, for this uh, period until the 4th of May, when we have our next talk, uh, literally in about four weeks, simply because of April has so many public holidays in between. All you need to do is use um, that code FLORA and you get yourself a 20% discount on all the books that are displayed on your screen as we speak right now. So please feel free to come on in, come and visit the garden. As, um, as a doc uh, has, has explained, we've got free guided talks, uh, guided walks happening throughout uh, the week at 10 and 11 o'clock. And all you have to do is just come on in, get yourself a garden, a garden into ticket and be able to join this uh, fascinating walk. We've got a wide range of amazing volunteers with wealth of knowledge uh, that are just out there to, to share their experiences with you. And if you are lucky on that particular day, you will have uh, our, our beloved uh, Nati taking you uh, for that walk around the garden. Um, so, but you know, I can say without a shadow of doubt that all our Botanical Society volunteers uh, that lead the walks at Kistenbosch National Botanical Garden are absolutely amazing. So please come on in um, and just enjoy. Uh, from myself, I think uh, let's wrap it up now so that we don't keep anybody in. For in 15 seconds, so what last words do you have for us uh, here on this online platform, uh, Doc? Thank you very much, uh, John. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you for your generous remarks as well. Thank you. Awesome. I couldn't have said it better myself. And uh, Doc, um, you look amazing. You don't look like you've aged one bit. In fact, if you and I were, walk, were to walk together in the garden, people would have, would, would mistaken us for me being the older guy. You know? Yeah. Well, the only difference is I've got a little bit more hair than you, uh, John. <laughs> yes, that's another thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, Nati, thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute really pleasure to have you on this platform. And, and I sure hope that we will have you again back here soon. Um, and, and, you know, all of us, you know, as we keep talking about this with Belinda and Kathy, we're just so excited about this opportunity to be able to, to capture these wonderful moments and be able to share them on our social media pages. We are literally building an online database of, of uh, enthusiasts, botanists, um, historians like yourself um, that share amazing knowledge with all of us. From my side, um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this call. Um, happy holidays, please stay safe. And um, we will see you guys on the 4th of May when we introduce another great speaker. She is also a Botanical Society member and she will also be picking up from some of what Nati was talking about, but just taking it a little step further. So I think that's also gonna be another fantastic talk coming up on the 4th of May. So uh, be sure to look out for that. In the meanwhile, please make sure uh, you go ahead and like our Facebook page, uh, the Kristen Bosch Facebook page, Room to Grow Facebook page, as well as Straight Nature Club Facebook page. From my side, John, it's been an absolute blast having you guys here. And thank you, thank you. Betty, for this amazing talk that you've had with us and the knowledge that you've shared with us. Until we meet again, everybody, see you guys at the next talk. Cheers, everybody. Have a fantastic uh, Easter holiday. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, dog. <laughs>